strategy and business development there. And I love my job. It's much, much cooler than what I used to do. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was almost positive I wouldn't be until I saw Matthew. years. <laughs> I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> so I'd like to start by saying that. Um, we are all so very privileged and blessed and everyone to share with all of you is the fact that throughout my life I've always I've always been a believer. That's really, to me, that's the key to, uh, to success in life. Um, I, said, I said before I was a recovering politician, I, I'm very, very blessed throughout my life, as everyone in this room has been blessed, I stated earlier. My father only had a sixth grade education, he barely made a right. Um, my mother did finish grade school and high school, um, Easter. And my other brother stayed back so many times, I almost caught him in school. Uh, my other, my, one of my sisters had uh, such a low score on her IQ test, they thought she was retarded. And yet today I have three sisters who hold doctor degrees, a brother who's a colonel in the Army Reserves, and another brother who's a school teacher. So I'm the black sheep of the family as a recovering politician. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can look back, I graduated in 1975, Davenport. <clears throat> And I could look back and see faces that were in this room when I was there. And believe it or not, out of the 127 individuals who have served in Congress, I served as a congressman. I was the first black Republican elected in 60 years, and the first black ever elected in an overwhelmingly white district. My district was 92% white. It was the 34th wealthiest district in America, located right here in Connecticut. Uh, every one of my elections, was a, I was a big joke. The joke was when I ran for city council many years ago that it was impossible for me to win. And I said, well, why is that? And I said, well, I was class president at Sacred Heart High School. They had four blacks in the entire school. And I'm pretty active here at Yale. Yale, I was on the basketball team. With the dubious distinction of having been the captain of the worst basketball team in the history of Yale. <laughs> <laughs> so I top, I top my first time to Play 24 games. So that's pretty bad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Can't get much lower than that. I lost my train of thought already. So, um, really good. Let me see where it was. I feel like that the white people would vote for me because I was black, and they said that black people weren't going to vote for me because I was a Republican. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to win my city council seat. and. Uh, uh, in 1985, I ran statewide. I was the youngest person to run statewide office in Connecticut's history. I ran for state patrol in 1986. Uh, four years, lost that election, but was the top vote getter. Ran in 1990 in an election that, once again, everyone just chuckled about because, once again, it never happened in our country's history where 90, a 92% white district would elect a black person. Now, I attribute that largely to this community, the Yale community. Because wherever I went, in Richfield, Connecticut, or Wilson, Connecticut, there were Yale. And they were very supportive financially and also vocal throughout my campaigns. I also attribute that to the Ivy League community. Because I would bump into brothers and sisters who went to Cornell and went to Harvard and say, we're behind you, how can we help? And so the family was a little more extended than even Yale when I ran. I served three terms in Congress, um, ran for the Senate in 1998 against Chris Dodd. And obviously, he's I'm here, so he won that election. And, and I've had my own lobbying business since since 1999. We've been just called Gary Allen Associates, a little boutique. We've been in existence, uh, as I said before, since 99, and doing fairly well. I've written uh, one book that was fairly successful, though no one has read it in this room, I'm sure, uh, called Searching for the Promised Land, which is just kind of a spiritual type book. And uh, also, I'm a visiting professor at uh, at Georgetown University and a visiting professor at Hampton University with my with one of my daughters with Hampton and my other daughters at, at Wellesley. Uh, defining moments at Yale, I, I've had so, so many. I, I was a volunteer at, um, at Webster to young people get their GED. I never forget my first class. And the instructor was a, a person who was at who was a Columbia grad, was also a state representative from Hartford, from the Hartford area. And uh, after our first class, you know, we go working with everybody there, and class ended. And you're going to prison, so you feel a little uncomfortable initially. 
And you know, I went over to the guy, I said, boy, this is great, how do I do it? He said, oh, you just fine, you're fine. I said, well, uh, it's really great that this prison's co-ed. And he looked at me and he said, it's not. <laughs> that went over like a lemon. Well, it's okay. Lots of flavor. I was that naive that some of the people in prison actually wore lipstick yeah. in prison, and but they were guys. Okay? So, well, I was so naive that I thought it was co ed. I was 19, okay? <laughs> now, getting back to my. When I was in 1975, I was able to look across the table and see there's 127 people who were of color that, that I ever served in Congress. I was fortunate enough to be the first person from my Ivy League school to serve as an African American in the graduate school. But when I was looking, if I went back to 1975, I saw four or five other people, five other, four other people who actually went on to become congressmen as well. Mel Reynolds went on to become a congressman, who was right in this room. Uh, Denise Majette, who I kind of flirted with a little bit, was right in this room. <laughs> You know Denise? Mm -hmm. Denise Benvet by Jack. Sheila, Lee, Sheila Jackson Lee, who's still serving right now. Um, and then there's two that I was not here when they were there, but I'm still graduated from Yale Law School, and that being Mel Watt from North Carolina and Eleanor Holmes Norton from Washington, D.C. Think about that. 127 members in the history of this country served in Congress as blacks and almost seven were from this institution. <laughs> That's strong. So as I started my remarks by saying that you are all very special, you all are. But I can look around the room and go back to 1975, who else did I see? Who else would I see? I would see Louis Gates, who was around when I was, was sitting at Yale. I would see my good friend Ben Carson, who hopefully you saw his movie the other week, mm -hmm. you know, like a couple of weeks ago, sitting right in this room with me. I was seeing James DeGraff, like someone you may not recognize the name of, chairman of the board of, 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 one, of the, one of the Fortune 500 companies out of Washington, D.C., Washington Gas. And oh, by the way, he finished Yale about three years. She decided to you know, get <laughs> Well, they all sat in this room. They all sat in this room. So we're all very privileged, but we're also have a lot of obligations ahead of us. And that I'm looking at the young men in this room in particular. There's a lot of great young, a very attractive young ladies here. I must say, but I, I, I also, I really focus in on our young men, and because I, that is a real challenge for, for our society, and it's so, so difficult for, for black males out there today. And what we have to do, and what you have to do is to, uh, you know, we have to try to bond together and, and network more. You know, I started thinking about being a politician, and Senator Lowe Weicker walked into, he walked on the campus of, of, of Yale University, the Yale alumni, and started to talk about politics. <coughs> Now, my priest at St. Bernard High School, he always wanted me to be mayor of Waterbury. Now, if you know anything about Waterbury politics, you'd love to be thankful that I never walked into Waterbury. Every mayor of Waterbury in the last 40 years has gone to jail. He's <laughs> <laughs> the current mayor. Yeah, is, he is still, you know, he's still the current mayor. So every former, I said former, every former mayor of Waterbury has been indicted for a long time. So, uh, but I, I started thinking about getting involved in politics you know, when I was in high school and really started to have those feelings become more cemented when I was here at Yale. And I would hope that each and every one of you will start to look at or think about that type of career. And you can say, oh, I'm going to make money. Well, you can, you know. I tell my students at Georgetown that three of the wealthiest, three of the wealthiest minorities I know had politics in their roots. And they started in staffers. One guy started as a staffer in Congress in Point Norris office, had this idea about cable TV back in, you know, way back when. So he joined the Cable Association, make a long story very short, found a BET worth two or three billion dollars when he sold it. Guy by the name of, guy by the name of, I won't mention his name, but he started out as a, as a staffer to Senator Javits, Jacob, Jacob Javits in New York, had an idea about this Medicaid thing and maybe eventually the states were gonna have to get into an HMO type of system. Well, make a long story very short, he started as a staffer, went out and became a lobbyist, and to, he sold his business five years ago for $700 million. And then you have uh, Raul Fernandez, who was chief of staff to, uh, to Jack Kemp, got involved in some activities, and uh, put his, you guys may have heard of it, and uh, needless to say, did really well. And so all of those individuals started out as congressional staffers and are worth you know, gazillions of dollars today. So, <laughs> And all of them started in positions that didn't pay him anything, right? 
you know, when I was a congressman, I paid my staff with some peanuts. I mean, literally, peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but they, they were able to parlay that experience into, into other, other experiences. The government politician, I know I probably run out too long, and I do apologize for that. I do welcome any questions. The final moments, um, I think I've talked long enough, so maybe I'll just end it. <laughs> put on the gas a little bit, but uh, uh, it, it, it's very nice to be back. I was actually back at the um, reunion, and the class of 83 was very, was very small um, in terms of the African Americans, and we all knew each other, and it was very nice uh, that most of us made it back, and there were a group of people that always seem to know what everyone's doing, so they made it their business to make sure that everybody came back, and I got to see a lot of my, my old roommates, but the, the special thing is that a lot of the, the people that I knew are, are still my, my friends, my roommates that I had then are still people I talk to maybe once a week now. So it's, it's, when I when I was here, I, I worked for a, I'm trying to think of the, the name of the association, I can't remember it anymore, it was a tutoring um, organization, and we would tutor um, students from the community. And so I did that for a couple of years and I really enjoyed it. And what sort of stood out for me then is I, I met my best friend who was a year ahead of me um, in that. And she turned, she is the godmother of my child. And, and it's just that kind of relationship. And what I remember about, about what sort of drew us together, and I, I just remember it because it was here in the house that, that the tutoring went on. There was this guy that I liked. I was, I was a freshman. And he played on the football team. I'd seen him at some party. And so I had stupid me. I had gone over and left a note on, on, on his job. So I saw Karen. She was a year ahead of me. I said, Karen, you know so and so. And she kind of, yeah. And I said, well, you know, you know what, I, you know what I've done? <laughs> and, I, and I told her, go get it. Go get it right now. So I, Somebody coming and should go get the note. He dates. I rushed back, got the note, it wasn't open. But that that was that was my <laughs>
but um, I do think back on the times that I that I spent here uh, with with so much fondness, and I think that I grew up a lot here. And and what everyone said is is really so true, and that the community really extends well beyond this campus. Uh, and there are so many people out there who are willing to help you. And one thing that I think that we all have to remember is that you're not alone, and you cannot make it alone, and you cannot be successful by yourself. You have to reach out to people. You have to get mentors. You have to find people who are willing to support you and nurture you and make 